In this introductory video to the amazing world of human embryonic development, I'd like to start just with this really profound question. What does it take to actually build a human? Well, I think where I'd like to start is with the human genome. Within our cells, we have about 20,000 different genes. And with processes like alternative splicing, we can use those 20,000 genes to make, uh, give or take, 100,000 different proteins. Of course, these proteins, as the blue-collar workers of the cell, give the cell a specific identity. And with that, we can identify around 200 histologically distinct cell types. And within these cell types, we see lots of unique specializations. And I think it's worth our time to consider some of these. Think about what your body can do with immunity, its ability to defend against the constant onslaught of invaders, and in that same vein, the ability to build and repair tissue. Of course, all this is only possible if we have the energy, so now we've got to consider metabolism. And of course, navigating in this environment, we need a way to sense, so we've got sensory, special senses, and then in response to that, the ability to move. And then, of course, how to regulate all of this stuff together, right, with the endocrine system and, of course, the cardiovascular system delivering oxygen, picking up carbon dioxide and other waste products. So transportation. So as we look at this, I hope the question then becomes, how? How does a cell know what to do? What to become? To begin to answer this, I'd like to introduce you to the concept of morphogenesis. And just to keep it simple, let's define this as simply developing shape and structure. Genesis, of course, means the beginning of or the birth of, and morph is shape. This term can apply to tissues, the development of organs, and of course the overall body plan. And how does all this happen? How do we create tissue? How do we create organs? How do these cells know what to do? Well, it just comes down simply to cell behaviors. What do we mean by cell behaviors? Well, what about the number of cells? Of course, to get more cells, cells can proliferate. To get fewer cells, cells will apoptose, they will die. Other important characteristics include cell shape, the size of the cell, what the cell is connected to and what it has the ability to connect to. In other words, it's adhesivity. And concurrent with adhesivity, we also need to think about location. These cell behaviors are fundamental to the process of morphogenesis, developing shape and structure of tissues, organs, and the overall body pattern. So then the next question is, well, how does a cell know what to do with shape, with size, with adhesivity? How does it do these things? Well, to understand that, we have to look at two different sources of instruction. This instruction can either come from genetics, or it can also come from epigenetics. Let's start with a basic understanding of genetics. Of course, you should be familiar with the idea that because we are a sexually reproducing species, we contain genetics from both mom and dad. Of course, these genes, this genetic information is found in our DNA. So let's draw a double-stranded helix real quick. And within this DNA, we find genes segments of DNA, and these genes provide essentially instructions for how to build proteins. Now, as we look at this, I want to introduce you to two, two terms, allelic variation and polymorphism. So while these genes are found on the same chromosomes, you, for example, have 23 homologous pairs of chromosomes. You have two chromosome ones, one from mom, one from dad, two chromosome twos, two chromosome threes, etc. And on those chromosomes, you have the same genes. So, you know, to use a random example that's easy to understand, let's think about an oversimplification of eye color. So I have a gene that's going to dictate what color my eyes are. And let's say that green line right there represents the location for this gene. Well, it's the same on both sets of DNA, the location. But the actual sequence might not be the same. In other words, maybe mom has blue eyes and dad has brown eyes. And so the sequence within this structure can be different. Each one of these is called an allele, and that's the idea of allelic variation, where slightly different instructions from mom compared to dad can lead to one being dominant over the other, or maybe a blend of both. And of course, fairly synonymous with this is the term polymorphism, which simply describes all the different alleles that are present within a population. So if I'm a cell in the iris of the eye, and I need to make this protein that's going to help dictate the color of my eye, then I've got a transcription factor that is going to come and it's going to read the instructions on the DNA and we are going to transcribe this section. In other words, make a copy of it. This is now my messenger RNA, this copy, and that's going to go find a ribosome and be translated to protein. And as we mentioned earlier, within our DNA, we have 20 to 25,000 different genes. And the way we read those genes can promote the production of 100,000 plus different proteins. So with that in mind, let's turn our attention to epigenetics. 
What is epigenetics? This might be the first time you've heard this term. Let's define epigenetics simply as the regulation of gene expression. Now, it's a little more complicated than that, but this is a good place to start. And as a lead-in, let's go back to the example that we were looking at before, eye color. Well, what if I'm a hepatocyte? What if I'm a cell in the liver? I don't really care about the gene associated with eye color. So the cell would naturally just look for a way to silence that gene. There are three basic principles that we can look at when we think about epigenetics. The first is DNA methylation. This is done by adding methyl groups to cytosine bases, typically at CPG dinucleotides. And importantly, this has a silencing effect. So if we go back and look at our genes, there are regions, typically in the promoter region, upstream of the start site of these genes, where we find these CPG dinucleotides and we attach a methyl group. And with those methyl groups attached, typically the idea is this blocks the recruitment of transcription factors and everything I need to actually transcribe those genes, this has a silencing effect. I can no longer transcribe these regions, and without transcription, I can't translate the protein. A second form of regulation is histone modification. You can think of histones as big barrels around which the DNA is wrapped. So here's my histone. We can wrap the DNA around it, and this provides important organization for the DNA, but also key regulation. Because to that histone, I can add a methyl group, I can add an acetyl group, I can even phosphorylate it. And any of these modifications to the histone can regulate its activity. Of course, this could either lead to activation or repression of any particular gene. All right, the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to epigenetics is the idea of non-coding RNAs. I'm sure you're familiar with things like messenger RNA, which is the copy of the gene we make in the nucleus and which is translated by a ribosome into protein. Non-coding RNAs are not translated, and they can serve lots of purposes. Remember, we follow the basic rules of base pair binding, and we recognize that RNAs can be useful in forming three-dimensional structures and also binding to other RNAs. And two common non-coding RNAs are microRNAs and long non-coding RNA. And an important distinction compared to histone modification or DNA methylation is that these are involved in post-transcriptional regulation. So as we combine this idea of genetics and the regulation of those genes through epigenetics, we can start to understand that morphogenesis simply comes down to the right combination of genes being expressed at the right time in the right place. Of course, this process turns out to be really complicated, but one key principle I want to introduce you to is the concept of gradients. To illustrate this idea, let's start with a cluster of cells. At this stage, early in development, the cluster is fairly similar throughout. All the cells have the same shape, the same size, no real differentiation going on. But what happens if a small cluster of cells, let's say right here, is induced by some signal to start creating and secreting a specific growth factor? Well, I hope you can appreciate that as this growth factor diffuses, it's going to form a gradient where the highest concentration of this factor is going to be closest to the source. And the further away we get, the less concentrated this factor becomes. We can regulate how far this factor diffuses based on its water solubility and its size. Regardless, we've established a gradient, a concentration gradient. Well, let's say at the same time, at the opposite end, we've got another small cluster of cells that starts to secrete a different factor. And of course, the same principle applies where we're high closest to the source and the further away from the source we get, the less concentrated the factor is. Well, I hope you can appreciate from this simple illustration, if we just highlight three different areas, this area here, this area here, and this area here, we see different cells getting different signals. In area number one, this is dominated by a pink signal and it's a strong pink signal. And that's going to have a certain effect on which genes are going to be activated. If we look at area number two, they're getting some pink, but not nearly as much as area number one. And they're also getting some green. Now, it might be that the green and pink signals are antagonistic to one another, or maybe they synergize and create a completely different effect. Either way, it's the mixing and matching of different concentrations and different signaling patterns that give us a certain effect. And of course, we can see in this last region over here, number three, this is just a dominant green signal with no pink in it. And so, especially early on in development, 
the idea of gradients is really, really important to establish body axes, to, sell, to tell cells what to differentiate into. And this is how we begin the process of morphogenesis. Now, there's one other idea I want to introduce to you regarding epigenetic gene regulation. This is a process called genomic imprinting. This definition is a little bit more complicated. This is the monoallelic gene expression in a parent of origin specific manner. In other words, for a given allele, the paternal gene, for example, will be silenced, forcing the expression of the maternal gene, or vice versa. If we return to our strands of DNA, the idea of genomic imprinting is that only one of these alleles will be silenced. So let's keep the methyl group on dad's gene, but erase the methyl group on mom's. This forces the monoallelic expression of mom's gene. Now, why would I do this? Number one, I want you to understand genomic imprinting isn't common. By my count, there's only less than 100 genes currently right now that we know are, gen are genomically imprinted. But they are very, very important. One hypothesis is that these are competing interests. For example, paternal genes tend to promote growth, whereas maternal genes tend to restrict growth. A really good example of a genetic syndrome where this effect is on full display is something like Beckwith-Weidemann syndrome. This is associated with the misexpression of a gene called IGF-2, insulin like growth factor 2, which is an important imprinting gene. And individuals with this syndrome show excessive lateral growth, so they show really wide feet, for example. And the classic sign is macroglossia, a very, very enlarged tongue that often cannot fit inside the mouth. But perhaps most importantly, imprinting ensures contribution from both maternal and paternal genomes. In this way, it's impossible, for example, for two eggs to fertilize each other, or two sperm. A sperm and an egg are required. So, with all these tools, we can begin to understand the journey of an individual cell. Of course, immediately following fertilization, all cells are stem cells. We can even subdivide classes of stem cells. So a totipotent stem cell has the ability to give rise to all tissue, both embryonic and extra embryonic. Soon after the first differentiation, then these cells become pluripotent. A pluripotent stem cell can give rise to embryonic tissue, but loses the ability to contribute to extra embryonic tissue like the placenta. And then downstream of that, we've got cells that are multipotent. Multipotent stem cells exist through adulthood. As an example, I'm thinking of the hematopoietic stem cell in your bone marrow that contributes to all of your red blood cells, where it has to make billions of red blood cells a day, but also all of your white blood cells, so your T cells, your B cells, your macrophages, megakaryocytes, all of these different cells that contribute to your immunity, all come from the same multipotent stem cell progenitor. And the process, as we've discussed, is simply taking these stem cells and putting them on a course toward differentiation. And it's important to note that in a differentiated cell, most genes are silenced. I only am expressing those genes that are necessary for my specific job, whether that's a neuron or a beta cell in the pancreas or a keratinocyte in the skin. I'm only expressing those genes that I need to do my specific job. And that gets back to the cell shape, the cell size, the adhesivity, the location. All of that is defined by the processes that we've spoken about, and that's the concept of morphogenesis.